Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar uh, Machine Learning for Data Engineers with the Deep Note and MindsDB. My name is Kostatin, and I'm your host today. And today with me, we have uh, Alan Campapiana, uh, data scientist from Deep Note. Hello, Alan. And Zoran Pandowski, senior full stack developer from MindsDB. Uh, before we jump into presentations, Please let me uh, briefly set the theme scene for this webinar. And uh, uh, on the right hand side, you can see the window uh, where you can chat or where you can ask questions. There is a questions tab on the bottom. And uh, we do recommend to use it to post your questions uh, during, the, uh, during the event. This will make sure we don't lose anything and uh, answer them at the end. Uh, however, you can also throw them in the chat, uh, but please uh, better use uh, questions tab. Um, uh, also, uh, I want to mention that uh, you will get a uh, uh, recording for, of this uh, webinar at the end. So if you miss something, you can uh, replay. And uh, you can download the presentation uh, at the right top uh, corner of your slide screen. There is a button uh, and you can click and download the presentation. So uh, now I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, our speakers and uh, Zoran, the mic is yours. Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Zoran Bandowski and I'm working as a senior full stack developer here in MindsDB. Alongside with me, we have Alan from uh, the Note. Hello everyone, Alan Campopiano here, data scientist at DeepNote. It's my job to engage adjacent data science communities and help them uh, to solve problems using DeepNote. Had my, my eye on uh, MindsDB for a very long time, and so it's my, my absolute pleasure to be uh, partnering up with them for this presentation. Thanks, Alan. So uh, we can start with uh, what is the mission that uh, we're trying to accomplish here in MindsDB. So our mission is to uh, democratize the machine learning by providing the machine learning capabilities directly where the data lives or uh, directly inside the databases. Uh, so as a quick introduction to our company or what we're trying to do. So MindsDB was founded in uh, December 2017 by our uh, founders, Jorge Torres and Adam Carrigan. Uh, till now, we have raised about 7.8 million in the C funding. Uh, we graduated from the YC Combinator and recently we was added as uh, one of America's promising AI companies by uh, Forbes. Just a little bit about DeepNote here. So DeepNote is a new kind of data science notebook. It's fully collaborative and it's really built to solve uh, problems for data teams. Uh, we just raised 20 million in the Series A funding, so we're really excited about our future. And you can see a bunch of our uh, about a bunch of our customers and users there. So um, you might be wondering how do how do we sort of interface with MindsDB? And um, well, as I said, I've been a huge fan of MindsDB for quite some time, and when I started at DeepNote, you know, one of the things that makes our notebook experience so lovely is that we treat SQL as a first-class citizen. And I knew about MindsDB and I thought it was great how they were democratizing machine learning and it was all with SQL. And I thought, oh, this is amazing for, for uh, data engineers and it would fit uh, you know, perfectly with DeepNote. So uh, we built an official uh, integration with MindsDB and now MindsDB and DeepNote work perfectly together. And you're gonna see a demo of all of this uh, a little bit later on. And we also, uh, we also wrote a, uh, a blog post about this, this very thing where we're saying, look, most people speak SQL, and so we want to create a notebook experience that, that takes advantage of that fact. And so in, in our notebook, we have SQL cells, essentially. So if you're familiar with Jupyter, you can have, say, like a Python cell. Well, in DeepNode, you can also have a uh, SQL cell. And uh, again, this is just uh, another example of MindCB and DeepNode coming together perfectly. And I'll share a link to this blog post where you can sort of read about how DeepNote integrates with other tools so nicely. So I'll share that with you a little bit later. 
Thanks, Alan. Uh, so uh, we can start with what is the challenge or uh, what we think is the challenge that we're trying to solve now. Uh, so training and deploying the machine learning models uh, is a complex problem and also expensive one. So it requires like a large and experienced team to set up the whole pipeline. So you, you will need uh, data engineers, then you need data scientists, machine learning developers. And once you have your model built, uh, you need additional develop development team and also a uh, DevOps team to move the model to production. Also having additional models per year. Use case, reiterating leads to a slow time uh, to moving to production. So depending on the company size, or uh, how large is your company? Uh, this takes maybe a few months, or for some company, even takes uh, a year to move that machine learning models to the production. So we can see on the, this chart uh, the whole like machine learning operations lifecycle. And for now, uh, that's divided on the three phases or uh, three steps. So the first phase is a data preparation part or uh, the companies needs to have the data, then they need to do the data cleaning and also data labeling, and then they are doing the feature engineering. After that, we're moving to the next step, which is the modeling part. So after you have your data, you need to uh, build the best fit model for that data. Then you need to do the hyperparameter optimization. You're doing the assembling, you validate the model that you have built, and then comes the next step, which is the deployment part, where once you have the model, once you have the model deployed, you need to uh, monitor that model and also uh, reiterate over that model and do the constant improvements of that model. So what we have found out is that um, if your data is inside a database, you already covered the first or the most maybe important part, which is the data preparation part. There was a recent survey from Forbes where uh, they interviewed the data scientists and they found out that like around 70 or 80% of the time of the data scientists is spent on the data preparation part. So if you have your data inside a database, that means you have already data, that your, your data is clean because it's in structured format and lives inside the database. And you already have the feature set up because each of the columns inside the databases uh, will be your feature. And then what we will try to solve or what MindsDB is trying to solve uh, after that is that we are trying to solve the modeling and the deployment part. And uh, we bring a concept here uh, in a place called uh, AI tables, uh, which will show you how that uh, works. So let's imagine a simple uh, income table that uh, stores income and debt. If you query the table for the income, for example, of uh, 80,000, it will return the debt value for 25,100. But what happened if we try to query the database or the table for the income value that is not persistent inside the database? We will don't get a result or there will be no result set returned from the database because we don't have that persistent inside the database. So what if we can train or fit machine learning model to this table uh, directly inside the database. Now, instead of us querying the, uh, the database table, we are querying the model or our AI table and get a predicted a result back. So for this, we have developed our own SQL statement or our own SQL syntax where you just use a create predictor, you're providing the name of the model, and then you're selecting from that model and you're getting your predictions directly on the fly uh, from the AI tables. So uh, this is for a simple example, how you are querying the uh, model, where you're providing the, the uh, values for which you want to make a prediction, you're selecting from the model and you're providing the informations inside the where close. And now uh, you will get uh, estimated value or predicted value returned back by the AI table uh, from MindsDB. So uh, we think of machine learning. So like the future life cycle in SQL or next generation machine learning operations. Uh, so till now we're thinking of a machine learning like a, something uh, outside of the databases which, create, which creates operational complexities. By moving the machine learning uh, inside the databases in a way that everyone can do it, uh, it's not like a for data scientists or for machine learning developers, but also for the uh, software developers, database administrator, and etc. It's all driven by the data. So we said, why we don't bring all operations inside the database closer to the data? And uh, being SQL based, uh, working closer to the data, having capabilities to look in the future and have the functionality already pre-deployed once we have uh, everything automated in our database, we think that changed the whole 
life cycle for the machine learning operations. Uh, so I think now we can show you a demo of how everything works through DeepNode as a client and then connecting uh, to uh, MindsDB. Give me just 10 seconds so I can share my screen. Okay, so uh, the, right now we're using DeepNode uh, to create this uh, notebook. And the first step for you to use uh, MindsDB is by having MindsDB instance deployed somewhere. So you have uh, two options if you want to host it yourself. Uh, the first option is uh, using Docker or using the Python uh, to deploy MindsDB in your local infrastructure, or you can use our cloud where MindsDB uh, takes care of the whole uh, deployment for you and also scaling for you. The second part is after you create um, or start MindsDB, you're creating a MindsDB integration inside the deep node. It's pretty straightforward. You just select MindsDB from the provided list, and then you're adding all of the configurations, values for uh, uh, host, password, username, and connecting to MindsDB. So after you have the integration or the notebook set up between uh, MindsDB and DeepNode, the first part here will be to connect to the database or how you are able to connect to your data through MindsDB. So for that, we have developed our own custom SQL statement, which we are calling create data source. And what this statement will do is it will create a data source, uh, for example, called demo underscore test, and you're providing the parameters for your database. In this, in, for this example, we are connecting to Postgres database, and we are providing the username, port, password, uh, host, and the database. Uh, this is through Postgres SQL, but MindsDB supports around uh, 15 different data sources. So we support SQL databases, we support few NoSQL databases, and also we support a few streams options. So after we are connected to, uh, to our database, or we have that data source between MindsDB and the database, we are able to execute all of the SQL statements directly through MindsDB. So uh, the first part will be just to uh, preview our data. So for this demo purpose, let me just run this query. So for this demo purpose, we will use a table inside our PostgreSQL database called airline passenger satisfaction. And uh, this data is a um, pretty straightforward data set. It contains um, airline information about their passengers. So they're storing different types of features as the gender of the pay of the passengers, uh, the age of the passengers, the customer type, are they loyal or disloyal customers, the type of travel that they're flying with, uh, the class, and also additional uh, survey ratings where the passengers were giving specific ratings starting from zero till five about the uh, Wi-Fi service, uh, ease of online booking, gate location, food and drink on the flight, and et cetera. And from this uh, data or from this table, what we will try to do and show you right now is how we will be able to use only SQL to train the machine learning model that will help us to predict the uh, passenger satisfaction. Are they are satisfied or neutral or dissatisfied? So after we saw the data, so the first part will be how we will be able to train the machine learning model. So for that, for that, uh, we have developed a SQL statement, which we'll call in create predictor. And create predictor in MindsDB words means predictor is machine learning model. So what we want to do right now is we'll create a predictor, which we'll call it satisfaction model. And then to that model, we'll say you need to connect to the demo, which is the data source that we have cre uh, created. And then from that data source, select everything that we are sending you with this query. So what this query will do is it will select everything from the uh, passenger satisfaction table. For the demo purpose, we are limiting to 1,000 rows. But here, uh, you have uh, flexibility to include specific columns, ex exclude specific columns, inner join, outer join, one or two tables, and etc. So it's uh, pretty powerful. And you can use or you can select everything that you want from your database. And that, as the last, uh, as the last argument here, we are saying predict or what's our target variable. So for example, for this um, demo purpose, our target variable is the customer satisfaction. So if I run this,
So usually it will take like a few seconds to run this query. And uh, after that, MindsDB in the background will uh, start with the model training. So uh, by default, we have our automated machine learning engine in the background. So depending on the data you have, MindsDB will try to figure out the data, uh, do the encoding of the types, and then uh, build the specific model for you. Uh, oh, you are, I already have a pre-trained model just to speed up on the demo purpose. So I will add like uh, some additional name here, satisfaction model underscore demo. So uh, the, na the name of the model must be unique because you will have that model visible inside the database. That's why you're not able to have the same name of the model twice. So this is running. So while it's running, uh, how you will be able after the model training start, we can see that it's successfully finished. How you will be able to see uh, the status of the model, is it's training, do, do you have some errors and etc. is by selecting uh, from the uh, predictors table and providing the name of the model. So for example, we have trained a model which we're calling satisfaction model. And what I can do now is select everything from MindsDB predictors where name is equal to the name of the my model. And if I run this, Right now, you will see that for the satisfaction model demo, the status is training. We don't see the accuracy because uh, it's still not finished. And we are seeing the, uh, the predicted value, and then we are seeing MindsDB version that uh, we're using to train this model. So since we limit this to 1,000 row, uh, I think it should take no more than a few minutes uh, to successfully finish with uh, training of this model. So we can see that still it's training. So well, one thing to mention here is that uh, once you start with the model training, the model training will happen on the instance where you're hosting MindsDB. So even if we're doing everything through SQL and inside the database, that doesn't mean that this affects your database because the model training and all of the predictions and querying will be on the machine where you're hosting MindsDB. If you're hosting on your environment, that will happen on that machine. If you're using uh, cloud MindsDB, cloud.mindsdb.com, uh, the model training will happen on the our cloud infrastructure. So you will have like a zero downtime on your uh, databases. Okay, yeah, so now we can see that the status of the model change. Now we're seeing that the status is complete. We are seeing the name of the model and we can see the accuracy for this specific model, which is around 93%. Then we can see uh, the target variable, which we are trying to predict the satisfaction and error is none, which means there are no errors for this model. Okay, so we have built our model. So let's get additional information from the model itself. So we have developed uh, two SQL statements or uh, SQL keywords, which we are calling describe, which can provide you additional information about the model that MindsDB built. So if we run describe satisfaction model underscore demo and run this, so now, now MindsDB will try to describe what happened for this specific model. And we can see that uh, about the accuracies, uh, which we have around 93% accuracy, MindsDB used a balanced accuracy score function. Uh, the second parameter here is the column importance or what MindsDB thinks is important uh, from your data. So here you can see uh, an empty object, but uh, since this is like in the beta, uh, we're releasing this uh, feature soon. The idea is that uh, the users have an option to see what kind of, or what MindsDB thinks are the most important columns from their data and start rating them from zero with, from zero or anything closer to zero, which means this column is not very important or relevant for the model till 10, which means anything closer to 10 is a very important column uh, and it's very important for giving you like a more accurate uh, model. Then we can see the output or the target variable that we are trying to predict, the inputs or all of the columns that we use to train this model, the data source that we are using and additional information about uh, about the models. And then there is additional options uh, for, for the users to see uh, how or what kind of features and callings 
we use for this model. So if we run describe satisfaction model underscore demo that features and run this, We will be able here to see how uh, MindsDB encoded all of the features inside our database or all of the columns inside our table. And for now, for example, we can see here that for the for the gender column, uh, MindsDB detected that as a binary and used the binary encoder for that. Uh, for age, it used uh, it detected as an integer and used numerical encoder for that. For example, for class, which is categorical value, MindsDB used one hat encoder. So uh, even if you're columns inside a database, all of them are like, for example, var chart, MindsDB will still be able to detect the type of them and then use specific encoder to encode those features. So by using the scribe model name and features, you will be able to see what kind of encoders we use to, to encode those features. Okay, so uh, the model training is finished. We know a little bit more information about our model. So how we will be able to get the predictions or query those models. So uh, we said that once you train the model, it becomes visible inside your database as a table or AI table, and you are able to query that. So let's just uh, select the target variable, which is satisfaction, the confidence for that, and additional information from MindsDB satisfaction underscore model underscore demo. And just for the demo purpose here, we'll provide additional information for the model where we can say, okay, predict is this customer satisfied? Uh, and our customer is 47 years old, he's, uh, he's male, and he's flying with a business class. So if we run this query, now we can see that uh, MindsDB predicted that this type of customer is neutral or dissatisfied with a uh, pretty high confidence here. And then you have additional uh, explained information, uh, like if there are some anomalies in the data or if the target variable was uh, was a, a number, you will see like lower upper, uh, lower bound, upper bound, and etc. cetera. So uh, in a short, this is like the basic flow, how you will be able to use uh, deep node using SQL cells inside the deep node to connect directly to your database and then use it using plain SQL to train the machine learning model, get a little bit more information about your model, and then doing the predictions from the model. Uh, here, I just show you like a one-time prediction by providing the parameters inside the where clause, but also MindsDB supports batch time predictions, which means if you join the model table with other table, you will get uh, predicted, uh, predicted values inside your table for each of the rows that you have in your data. So I think that, uh, we can just uh, jump straight to the question and answer and we'll try to answer all of the questions that you have. Great, uh, thanks Zoran. And uh, I see we do have uh, a lot of questions from the audience. I will start uh, from, from the first ones. And uh, just to mention, we have uh, Another colleague, uh, Patricia Sardamardini uh, from MindsDB joining us. He, uh, hi, Patricia. Patricia is a, a machine learning research engineer. Uh, so he really knows about the internals, uh, algorithms and libraries. Uh, and I've seen we had such questions already. So um, let me start. First question is uh, from Kostya. Uh, how accurate is MindsDB engine on predicting? Who is going to take this? Um, I can take it. Um, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, so the MindsDB engine truly has, um, it has the possibility of using more than one backend. So the one by default, which is what Soren showed you, um, Soren Allen showed you, is um, called Lightwood. And Lightwood is a declarative machine learning AutoML framework, meaning that you tell it what you want to predict and it will figure out what needs to be done in order to predict that amount or label or, or whatever the quantity is that you want to predict. So the accuracy here truly depends on the task that you have defined. So if you're predicting a column that has labels on it, so essentially a classification task, right? The accuracy will either be normal 
accuracy or balanced accuracy if the data set is detected to be unbalanced, for instance. If it's a numerical target, then maybe the accuracy will be R2 score or maybe it will be mean, uh, the, the mean absolute squared error. It kind of depends on the automated decision that the system makes, but it also is subject to, um, to customizability, meaning that the user through SQL can access to a piece of syntax that is called using. So when you create the predictor, you specify predict from, and then you say using such and such parameters. And inside those, you can essentially specify the type of accuracy that you want to, um, to, me to, to measure when training and then deploying the model. So just that's like the long answer as to what is the accuracy now in terms of performance. We have, we continuously run benchmarks and um, we're up there in terms of AutoML frameworks when it comes to the, um, the OpenML AutoML benchmarking suite. So we're, we're comparable to say H2O, uh, H2O AutoML, um, Auto, Auto Keras, and I think Teapot, um, Auto Scikit Learn. So we are in good company for sure. Of course, depends on what you're predicting, right? Um, but that's the answer to this one. Okay, thanks, Patricia. The next question is, uh, what are the main keywords in MindsDB that resume what we can do? Uh, I'm not sure what's the question. Is it about syntax or? Yep, we'll I can answer that. So, yeah. so uh, if you go to our documentation, which uh, we'll share the link to that, it's docs.mindsdb.com. Uh, we have a section called SQL API. And there we have documented all of the SQL keywords and all of the SQL statements that MindsDB support. But uh, we can summarize them like in a, in a few. Uh, you have a SQL statement uh, that we support for creating a data source or creating the integration between MindsDB and your database. Then we have a SQL statement for uh, training the model, which is create predictor statement where you're uh, training the model. And then uh, to that create predictor statement, you have additional keywords we can provide. For example, if it's time series problem, you can order by group by your data and provide additional parameters, uh, which you can find in our documentation. Then we have a describe function, which is also a SQL statement that we have developed in MindsDB and describe, give you like a more, uh, more information about the trained models. And we are trying to increase the support for describe to give the, uh, to give the users more more information about the automated models that MindsDB built for them. And then at the end, it's just simple select statement where you just, once the model is de automatically deployed in your database and it's visible as a table, you're just selecting directly from them. Uh, and I think that in a general, those are the most, uh, the most required, but also we have a few additional ones like drop, which is drop name of the model where you are deleting the model, drop name of the data source where you're deleting the data source integration. And everything of this can be found in our documentation under SQL API section. Hey, thanks, Soren, for this uh, uh, clarification. And uh, guys, you can see uh, the links to the docs and uh, other useful content uh, in the chat. Um, next question is, uh, what, mine, what ML libraries are under the hood of MindsDB? Yeah, so great question. Again, this is um, specifically for the default engine, Lightwood, which uh, is the one that we develop. And I can tell you that the main focus there is PyTorch for neural networks. Um, and then we use LightGBM as well and scikit-learn, depending of course on the type of, of problem, we will deploy a series of different models that may get ensembled at the end. Um, so so the main ingredients would be, yeah, scikit-learn, uh, like GBM and then PyTorch. And for time series, we also use some of the wrappers that um, rather the utility tools that scikit-time offers, which is also an awesome, awesome library. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the answer for, for the custom, sorry for the default uh, machine learning engine. Yeah, thanks. And I think the next question is uh, very much related. Uh, can I use our own custom model? in the SQL statement for training. Right, yeah. So actually, 
the um, we have deployed uh, changes quite recently and now you're actually able to do so but like you can bring any sort of custom model through um through either mlflow or rayserve those are the two main apis that we work with at the moment and so you can specify um how like essentially what should be done when you train a model or when you predict with the model and this will be linked to MindsDB when you create the predictor you you have to give the the access points for both training and predicting so essentially something like create predictor from url dot predict equals some url which is going to be of course the the api that that either mlflow or, or ray server will use to to call the model right and when you're using this method you're truly liberated from from um, whatever you know constraints you might find with an automl framework you can instead deploy whatever custom logic you're looking for and truly bring your own model to mysdb um so, so i think we have docs for for this um maybe not in the page maybe in github i'm not actually sure yeah so jorge just, just jorge by the way our ceo linked um a, a page there for you guys to check it out but it is possible you can either use mlflow or racer for this yeah thanks patricia for for detailed answer and by the way we have uh uh, another colleague, uh, actually, Jorge Torres is our CEO of MindsDB uh, joining us. So uh, welcome, Jorge, and uh, hope he will uh, help us here with uh, some interesting answers. Uh, the next question that we have um, is, uh, is uh, how can I fine tune the model? Is it a black box? Actually, uh, I think Patricia or Zoran, some of you already touched this a little bit uh, on the SQL syntax, but can you uh, expand a little bit more uh, on how you can tune the models? Yeah, so, so the models are, essentially we try to be transparent um, with the default flavor, of course. Um, and by this, I mean that after training, we deploy a model analysis phase where we try to come up with a, with a calibrated sort, uh, set of predictions. So the confidence should be a, a good confidence. Um, and we also, I think Soren mentioned something about the column importances being, being a, a, an upcoming feature. It turns out it's actually, I mean, you can use it. It's just that by default, it's not activated. So you have to use the using syntax to, to specify that actually you do want column importances in there. So there's a few tools um, for for measuring, you know, essentially the explainability, which actually ties into the next question. So I'll just answer both of them here. Um, so you have that, and then if you were to bring in your own model, supposedly you would be able to to interpret better than than whatever the the automated pipeline is. So you would start uh, bringing in your own tools for this and using them when calling the predicting method, right? So going back to the fine tuning model uh, or, or the fine tuning uh, part of the question, um, we have syntax for retraining, I believe, right, Soren? Um, maybe you can expand a bit further on that one. It's actually convenient. Yep. So uh, for, 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 for extending that default configuration, we have a, a SQL keyword, which is called using. And after you run the create predictor statement, you're providing that uh, using keyword and it accepts uh, key value parameters in a JSON format or just standard key value parameters where you will be able to tweak some of the parameters uh, that MySDB will do automatically for you. Uh, so that's already, uh, you can check that or find that in our uh, using keyword statement inside the documentation. I posted yeah. the link on on the chat. So there's a, the link for the retrain as well as for the using statements. Thanks. Uh, the question from Hassan Ibrahim was about model. Uh, what about model explainability? Uh, Patricia touched this briefly, but uh, do you want to add something? Um, so let me think. So. 
I will add that um, if you're working with the default engine, Lightwood, it's it's designed for easy extensibility. So if, let's say, for instance, you're happy with the performance of a Lightwood model as reported by the accuracy metrics, right? But you want more explainability. Well, depending on what you want, but most of the things are achievable within this framework, is that you would add something that's called a an analysis block that would get executed at the at the end of the analysis phase and it can use as input the result of previous ana uh, analysis or explainability methods so imagine you have a a text um, sort of model right like you trained you trained for a um, text sentiment analysis and you have a transforming going on and maybe you want to see you want to take a look at the attention layer and, and see what weights get triggered when you pass some input well in that case you could add a custom bit of code that would essentially access those layers and give you information rather, I mean, it could be by printing or by adding to the output of the explain method, right? And that way you can essentially augment the explainability of your model without having to resort to a bring your own model um, sort of pipeline. So you can, you can get the automated uh, model that was trained for you, you can modify the code because we actually deploy it with code, with Python code, um, and you can add this custom block. So there's also that possibility. Um, it's something that we ourselves use as, as maintainers of the tool. Like everything that's default has actually been added as analysis blocks. Um, so the system is definitely convenient for that. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I guess, when it comes to explainability, you can do a lot of things. So. So, I mean, if you want to try this, Hassan, for sure, give us feedback of, of um, whether you like the, the way that we have it implemented right now or, or not. But yeah, it, it is possible to, to delve deeper into this. Thanks. And by the way, uh, if you uh, want to discuss more details about uh, internals uh, and uh, uh, more questions, please feel free to join our Slack community and uh, keep, keep um, keep in touch with our engineers like Patricia and others. Uh, the next question about uh, is about academic pricing from Greg. Uh, Jorge, would you like to take this? Yeah, so right now anyone can train minds to be um, free of cost. So it, it is open source and, and you should be able to try it even on on premise without any any costs um we are in the process of understanding what is the best way to price our cloud um and and, and i think that up till now any person that joins the cloud uh will get uh, a very decent amount of tokens for for free if you want more tokens than what is assigned to you on on the cloud then to reach out i i think that we really want to make sure that MySDP uh, is democratizing machine learning and the cost of it shouldn't be um, what prevents you from using it. So yeah, please please let us know if, if the offerings that we have are um, not suiting your, your requirements and, and then we can discuss it. Um, we certainly believe that academic pricing would be part of like, the standard pricing model that we will have at some point. But um, given that right now we are just on the process of ensuring that the cloud is as stable as possible. Um, in the meantime, you, you guys or everyone is welcome to use MySP for, for free, both on premise and in cloud. Thanks, Jorge. We have a lot of questions today, so let's move on. And uh, the next question is from uh, Joao. Uh, MindsDB. Uh, the anomalies referred is based on a specific uh, DQ over the data used on the predict train. DQ hmm. um, I'm not sure what DQ means in this context. I can talk a bit about the um, the way that the anomaly detection work, uh, works right now. Um, we use a statistical framework that is called conformal prediction, and it is model agnostic meaning that after we train the predictor uh, in this analysis phase that I mentioned, we figure out um, what is essentially expected by the model. 
in such a way that when you define an error rate, this error rate should be well calibrated, meaning that um, if the, the model is 90% confident, then on average, you would expect it to be, to be wrong 10% of the time. Um, so this is um, very interesting and powerful, and it gives us a natural notion of something being anomalous uh, when it's outside of the bounds, if it's something numerical, or if it's outside of the predicted label, essentially wrong, when we are classifying. So we have specialized, I think, into anomaly detection when the target is a numerical one, so think time series or, or regression. And the anomaly will be detected based on whatever was passed to the training data set um, when training the model, right? We assume that is well-formed data that doesn't necessarily have anomalies. And so the width of the bounds or the predicted sets, labels, right, um, will be engineered based on whatever was seen at training time. And then when you're deploying the model in production, whatever is outside of those bounds or the predicted label will be triggered as an anomaly. Now, again, um, we have specialized on numerical anomalies rather than, than in classification. So if, if um, Joao, you're looking at um, essentially anomaly detection for classification purposes, like do reach out through the Slack channel and we can probably think of, of a better, I think, approach because in, th there's ways of improving that. Uh, right now, we haven't had a need for it uh, because, again, we're focusing more on the, on the time series slash numerical side of things. But but yeah, that's the framework we use, and it's it's quite powerful. I think it's a uh, it's a it's a really nice feature. Okay, uh, thanks. And the next question is: Are Unix timestamps detected correctly as a date? Yeah, so I'm going to take this one again. Um, going back to the default engine lightweight right because if, if it's a if it's your own model you should be specifying when you create the predictor that a certain column would be a date right so that's the first thing but if you're not if you're just creating an automated uh, predictor then lightwood does have a type inference system so based it, it essentially takes a look at the data of each column in the training data set and it tries to figure out whether it's looking at a categorical column uh, whether it's binary or multi-label, uh, right? Multi-class. Um, if it's numerical, is it a quantity? For example, currency, is it something that is more of a, um, I don't know, text, right? And if it's text, is it short text? Is it rich freeform text? Um, is the text such that it can be interpreted as categories, right? And um, within all of this possible um, data types, dates are one of those and so when you get something that looks like a unix timestamp lightwood should be able to determine okay this is a date we're going to treat it as such and and you know from that you can essentially generate the predictor with the knowledge that this is being treated as a date so the answer is yes it should great thanks uh, for this expanded answer. And uh, the next question is from Robert. Is this available to install and set up on a closed network or is it only available in the cloud? Zoran, would you like to take this? Yep, sure. Thanks, Costa. Yeah, so uh, MySDB is a cross platform, which means you can install any platform you like. Uh, you can use uh, Docker, or you can use uh, Python installation to install it. And if you have uh, your environment set up in a private network, you will be able to do that by just wrapping our dependencies inside the tarball. And you can use that tarball uh, to start and run MindsDB. After you have that in an isolated environment, for example, with all the internet connection, et cetera, MindsDB will don't make any, uh, any calls outside of your environment. So just using the tarball inside your isolated environment, everything should work for you. Okay, thanks. And uh, the next question is from Carlos Moreno uh, from Venezuela. Uh, hi, I'm Carlos Moreno from Venezuela, Universidad Central. Uh, can MindZB use data sets from open data national repositories? Thanks. I think it's uh, uh, like many countries, they have uh, open data repositories and it can yeah. be universal, not just to Venezuela, right? So who, yeah. can, who want to take this? 
I can answer that. So yes, uh, you're certainly able to do any open data uh, data sets and try them in in, uh, in MindsDB. Personally, me, I have tried MindsDB with too many different data sets that are available there in uh, open data portals using uh, Seeken. And also most of those data portals allow you option to get like an endpoint from the data that you have published there, like an JSON file or all data file, which you're able just to get that file, upload in MindsDB, without the need to move that to the to the database, or if you like, you, you are still able to do that. And also, as far as I know, most of the open data portals have their uh, data store somewhere. Like for example, most of the open data portals using Seeken uh, have uh, PostgreSQL as their main data source. And then using that data source from the PostgreSQL, you're able directly to connect that PostgreSQL instance to MindsDB, and that's how you will get that predictive analytics on top of your uh, open data data store. Thanks, Zoran. And we move to the next question uh, from Alan. Uh, does MindsDB give users any built-in visualizations to help them better understand the data? I'm not sure who wants to take this. Um, well, I mean, so, okay. So we're big, pro big proponents of um, data being like the data layer being the best place to to essentially understand the data. So we try to you know point users into ins inspecting things through SQL. We had at one point a as part of our graphical user interface a set of features to understand whether there were outliers on the data, um, what were the possible values for each column, um, and the distributions for for you know for for you know, um, categorical columns and so on. I think that has been deprecated, though. I'm not sure, Soren, can you confirm? Oh, sorry, yes, I was muted. Yeah, yes, you can do that. But also, uh, I mean, uh, we don't specialize too much inside the visualization part. You have an option uh, to get the visualization, use a tool like uh, even in DeepNote, right now you're adding, uh, the DeepNote is adding uh, visualizations and once you connect it to MindsDB and you get the predictions back, you have that option to use the visualization direct from DeepNote. Or if you're like a BI, BI, BI tool uh, user, you're able to use WA or other or other uh, visualization tool to visualize uh, uh, the predictions, for example, from MindsDB. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. We really have a lot of questions, so let's move on. Um, next question is about auto-retraining models, and so this was already covered, so I can just refer uh, to the previous answers. Uh, there was a syntax uh, about auto-retraining models. And we move on to the Elena Zhang's question. Uh, which tutorial materials would you recommend for a newbie to MindsDB? Yeah, so uh, in our documentation, which is docs.mindsdb.com, we have a whole section called tutorials, which you can find tutorials for different type of uh, machine learning problems or different use cases. We are constantly trying to grow the, the number of tutorials that we support, even if we are open for our community to support or help us with the tutorials. And if you start uh, using MindsDB and you love what MindsDB is doing, you are free to uh, take your data, write a use case for us, and just submit it to our documentation, and we will publish that. So for in the future, other users can follow up to the tutorials. But in a short, to answer your question, in our documentation, we, we have a section tutorials, which you're able to follow that. And also uh, in our YouTube channel, usually we have uh, videos of the uh, webinars that we are doing or a live presentation. So you can find some of the videos there. Yeah, and just, uh, just a quick uh, follow-up on that. Um, I'll share it in the chat again, um, but the a great way to get started is actually just to fire up the notebook and watch MindsDB in action, which is kind of like the whole, um, the whole magic of this partnership. So if you want to see things set up right away, uh, Deep Notes got you covered there, and I'll, I'll share that in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Alan, for that. And just to mention that... Uh, Everything that I've shown you through this demo, there is already a template for that uh, through notebook. So just feel free to to uh, open the notebook, select the template, and you can just follow up to the same tutorial that we have presented to you. But if you like to connect to your to your database, you have still the options to do that. Everything through the uh, deep note. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, uh, next question is from uh, Joao again, uh, and uh, I will read it. MindZB have any kind of orchestra? Uh, so does MindZB have any kind of orchestration features to automate uh, machine learning pipelines using MindZB, MindZB commands, or so? And if so, uh, is there any kind of user interface for this pipeline definition configuration? Yeah, so let me see. Um, as far as automating the machine learning pipeline, there is a very big spectrum, right? Like it goes all the way from data pre-processing on the data layer, then further pre-processing that may not be possible to do in the database, feature engineering, model training, and then you know analysis, validation, maybe you know in between ensembling. And then you start thinking about deployment. So we at MindStb understand that the entire thing is the machine learning pipeline. And the answer to this is if you're using the default engine, you will get most of it automated just by saying, by declaring what you want to predict. So when you say create predictor name, uh, predict some column from some data, this will generate some bit of, well, first it will generate uh, a JSON-like file that you can tune to your liking, um, responding to the UI uh, bit of the question, right? So it will generate a JSON AI file. That, that's how we call it, JSON AI. And in there, you will see all like the entire specification for the model, starting from what type of data cleaner it will have, passing by you know the encoders that it will use, the type of models, what what kinds of ensembles it's going to try and how the analysis is going to look. So when you create a predictor, th there's actually a way to, to create it, but not train it, right? And then you can go and edit the file to your liking and then uh, commit to it and generate and train the actual predictor. So th there's that avenue for you to customize the pipeline that gets generated, right? And we have found this in our experience to be pretty powerful because you, get, you have access to the cleaning st uh, stuff in the pipeline, then the model, the encoders, the analysis, and you can tune it to your liking. And then once you actually commit the model, you, you have the Python code, you have the file stored in, in a certain path that you can customize. And so even after this fact, you could start tinkering again with that Python code um and and customize the the behavior even more like if it's something that's not supported by the json uh representation um so yeah it's it's certainly possible uh, i think we have uh use cases of this uh, and it's it's been it's been demonstrated that it's a powerful tool so great question and and yeah i think the using statement would be the way to explore this further i'm not sure i'm trying to look at the chat here um yeah, I think Jorge, Jorge actually linked to this. Um, there's a link up there that says using statement. You should you should check that um, and and see just to get a, a glimpse of how you can actually specify this from SQL, right? Uh, and start that way. So, great question. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for your questions and for answers. Uh, let's move on, and I will switch back to the question uh, posted in the chat uh, from Andrew. And the question is, can the training be run continuously on databases that are updated frequently, or must it be run manually? Yeah, so uh, for now, uh, you can just run the retrain uh, statement manually, but we're working on a new feature where you will be able to provide uh, time to the, uh, to the retrain logic. For example, you can say retrain this in X number of days, but also we are trying to increase the support of the automation tools out there. So for example, at the moment we are working on integration with dbt, where for all of the ta automated tasks, you will be able to integrate MindsDB with dbt and then uh, use that uh, constant uh, automation or retrain of the models through dbt. But that's like a working in progress feature and should be released pretty soon. Yeah, thanks, Zoran. And by the way, we have a beta community. So if you want to uh, join, uh, you can do this on our website. 
Um, okay, now moving to the next question um, from Ankit. Uh, and he's asking how the training and inference can be scalable. If you want to use a standard machine for database, but uh, that shouldn't affect the model performance, how is it possible here? So uh, I think actually Soren kind of implied this, or actually no, uh, he he, he uh, expanded upon this during the presentation, which is that uh, MindsDB can execute on uh, like essentially wherever. So so you can split your computing resources. Uh, between different machines. So you could have one machine that has the database, right? And it sends the data back and forth to the MindsDB instance, right? Even though you feel the predictor is kind of a table and you, you interact with it through SQL, in reality, you could have something like some sort of um, architecture where the data is being passed to another computer with another dedicated set of hardware specialized for, for machine learning inference. So. GPUs and, and, and good CPUs and a lot of RAM. So that's the way you would not affect model performance uh, and database performance like, like it, uh, simultaneously. Um, and in that, in that sense, you could make it be a scalable process, if that makes sense. Maybe Soren, you can, you have additional thoughts here. Yeah, so I'll... Yeah, that, that, that's like a good explanation, Patricia. Thank you. But uh, I mean, additional additional thing here is to know that once you run the SQL statements, they're going to MindsDB directly. And we have our own SQL server, which is talking MySQL wire protocol. That's how MindsDB is able to understand all of the SQL queries that you're running to MindsDB. Once you run that query, MindsDB is parsing that query and then uh, retrospectively call, calling, uh, calling the model, uh, which is uh, like the Lightfoot model, for example, which uh, lives on the machine where you're hosting MindsDB. It's visible inside your database as a table, but we are just using that name. And everything that will happen, all of the computation, um, our um, extensive resource task and everything will happen on the machine that, where you are hosting MindsDB. And for uh, parallelism, uh, spinning instance, uh, for multiple models and etc., our cloud.mindsdb.com is uh, designed for that one. So for each of the trained models, we will uh, start a specific GPU optimized instance to speed up on the training time. And that, that's taken care of uh, in our cloud. OK, thanks. Um, next question is from Alan again. When uh, machine learning is in the data layer, how do you think about the role of data scientists as they work with data engineers? Very interesting this is a, question. Yeah, yeah, it is. So personally, I think the um, they should probably work even like more tight knit because now when you train models directly from the data layer, it becomes obvious to the data scientist how important it is for the data to be in the format that your model truly needs it to be. So so you start probably working um, in, a, in a closer fashion with the data engineers, right? Um, in my opinion, and I think this is probably a company-wide thing, um, it will become a more harmonious process, if that's even a word. So it will be more natural, it will be hopefully more efficient, um, and it may have additional side effects for, for the greater good in, in the sense that, you know, better data for models might mean a better just, you know, data warehouse or database, right? Better design, I mean. so. It's a very good question. I'm not sure if Soren will agree or Costa, but that's my take. Yeah, I guess people want to know if we are dis disrupting data scientists or not uh, with these tools. Yeah, but like I think that data scientists will not be disrupted because there are things like JSON AI that you presented and uh, um, like very much advanced features that actually are for data scientists. Uh, so yeah. I think yeah, and bring it's your own very money, universal. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, thanks, thanks to both of you. Okay. Um, next question is from Greg. Uh, are you planning to use stepwise regression? Um, so interesting question. I think right now we have a regression model. Well, I mean we have several, but um, we have one that is a more 
you know, classical linear regression that seems to perform quite well. So I don't think it's very likely for us to include stepwise as part of the default suite. Having said that, you can, I mean, hopefully, you can quite easily implement a stepwise regression mixer, which means that like, a, like a model, right, yourself, and then integrating it would be trivial. Like you would just say something like, create predictor, uh, predict some column from some data, and then using, and you would say something like sub models equals your stepwise regression model, and that should work out of the box. So um, the answer would be probably not ourselves, but we're more than happy to assist you with actually, you know, uh, going through that journey of, of getting your own stepwise regression model into um, the, the ML engine that we have. Okay, uh, thanks. And so we're really out of time. Uh, and we're just taking one more last question and the uh, rest will just invite you to join our Slack channel and uh, ask your questions there. We will definitely uh, get back to you and answer everything. So the last, the last question uh, we will take today is the question about the trade-offs between machine learning in the data layer and doing it traditionally. And after that question, we'll uh, go to the to end up the event. Yeah. Um, well, this I guess this is the more fundamental question. It is after. I mean, it permeates our very existence. I think um, the data layer, right, is just fundamental for for organizations to be aware of what they're working with, and of course, in terms of data, but also in terms of models, right? Like it's so usual for big organizations to, you know, um, be inefficient about the way that they pass training data and inference data from one place to the other. And they're, they're, they just end up building separate silos for this, right? Um, you can get out of hand quite easily uh, if you're not strict about the way that your, your team members build this scaffolding, right? So we think if you work with machine learning from the data layer, you're minimizing the risk of such a situation happening. And so it ends up being a more, you know, efficient process and probably easier for you in the in the long run to, to, to end up with a productionized model or a set of models quicker and more efficiently, even though it may involve your own logic in there, right? When you're when you're infusing it and forcing yourself to operate within the data layer you may become more aware of what you're working with. Um, not only the data scientists, also the data engineers, the machine learning researchers, everyone. So I think that's the vision we have. Um, as for trade-offs, you know, probably this is a new concept or, or one that's not really mainstream. So getting people to, to think about it in the terms that we propose may be a con in the, in the short term. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll get there, right? So. That's my point of view. Uh, maybe Soren or Costa. Yeah, thanks. It's, it, it can turn to a one hour, one hour uh, long discussion, actually. <laughs> so I would recommend everyone to can keep uh, discussing this and share your thoughts. Uh, what do you think of MindsDB on our Slack community channel? Uh, please don't forget um, to uh, visit our GitHub repo and give us a star if you like our project and what we do. Join our community. And uh, I just want to hand over to our speakers, Soren and Alan, uh, for closing remarks. Yeah, so um, on the deep note end, um, as I say, we love to promote other tools. We feel that um, we can showcase tools in their in their natural habitat with very little setup, and um, so this is how we this is how we build partnerships. If you're curious about MindsDB, sign up for a Deep Note. It's free. You get lots of compute hours for free. Small teams are free. As soon as you click New Project in Deep Note, there's a template right there for MindsDB. All the code is written for you. You can follow the instructions and start making queries against those models right away. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful way to learn new tools. Uh, so check us out, deepnote.com. And uh, we also have a community. So come ask questions. Uh, that's community.deepnote.com.
Thanks, Alan. And an uh, additional thing that we want to share here is if you want to engage with our community, join our Slack or go on our GitHub. We have a lot of open uh, enchantment is or issues that you are feel, feel free to contribute to. You can join our Slack, talk with our team, and we can help you uh, to get set up and also uh, give you like a way for, for, for our contributions and contribute to an open source product. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we are closing uh, today's uh, event. And uh, I just really want to give big thanks to Alan for joining us and for uh, actually highlighting MindZB in uh, DeepNode community and uh, like our speakers, Zoran, Patricio, and Jorge, who already left uh, for their uh, active answers. And I hope you really enjoyed this. Uh, stay tuned uh, for our next webinars at uh, mindzb.com slash events. Uh, visit our GitHub channel, uh, GitHub um, repository, repository, join our Slack channel, and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.